Hi. Yeah. Um, my name is Erica Smith. I'm the deputy director here at YEI, and just I'm really thrilled to have um, all of the Texas campers, the VCP teams, the summer fellowship, and also the other attendees that are interested in learning more about what YEI is doing, and also learning more about what Mark has to share. Um, just to give you a brief snapshot um, of YEI, the, the, the programs that I described um, with the summer fellowship, we have some of the top teams that have come out of uh, our programs throughout the year that are growing and, and, and advancing their adventures to try to basically take them and commercialize their opportunities. And so we're thrilled to have nine teams being very active in the program. We also have uh, some of the deep, uh, programs that uh, we folks are working on that are basically groups that have um, are launching their product as well and are hopefully coming in and uh, advancing their ideas as part of the programs that we develop here um, in advance of the summer, or, uh, working with the summer fellowship team. We also have the tech boot campers, which are spending 10 weeks um, doing nothing but programming and learning how to uh, do uh, web development, and we're thrilled to have them here as well. And I think that all of the pieces um, that are part of the, the, the YDI programs between the uh, fellowship, the VC, summer VCP, and also our tech boot camp are really a part of what Mark has um, pieces and has shared in his history of launching ladders, um, also um, Nosen as well, and also as an alum here from Yale. So I think um, with that, I will turn it over to him to describe some of his background and how he kind of took all these different components from entrepreneurship to technology and has created some very successful businesses going forward. So with that, Mark. Thank, thank you, thank you. All right, great. Well, uh, first off, uh, you know, you're all very strange. You're strangest most of all because your team's playing in the World Cup, but all of you are strange because you're sitting here in a semi-hot, you know, classroom to talk about entrepreneurship and technology here on a uh, gorgeous uh, summer day. So uh, congratulations so for being so weird, all right? Uh, so I'm Mark Sinadella. Uh, I'm uh, Yale class of 92. I was in TD. I I yeah, right? I snuck in today and like the butt, the <laughs> I snuck in there today, and I, like the buttery is like completely like different and upgraded, and compared to when I was here, and uh, uh, it, that's it's amazing, it's uh, fantastic. Um, so I, here's what I thought I'd do. Uh, we got what 90 minutes, ish. So uh, why don't I uh, I'll talk for like 45, and uh, I'll do like a third on how I got from Yale to kind of starting anything, uh, a third on you know, my first uh, a big hit entrepreneurial venture, uh, the ladders and then kind of a third on uh, this next chapter and doing it again. And then we'd love to take your questions and comments and, uh, and feedback and, uh, and, and dirty looks from people whose country is hosting the World Cup. All right, does that sound good? Yeah. That sound like a plan? And if, you got a really, really and if you have a really great question, you can ask it in the middle, but only if it's like really the best question that you've ever thought of in like your entire life. So, uh, uh, so I was sitting, I was just mentioning, I was sitting uh, up uh, like in that third row from the back in fall of 91, and, the American elections uh, class. I was a poli sci uh, a major, and I didn't understand a dang thing about business or, or technology or anything uh, when I graduated uh, here at Yale. Yale doesn't have a, a business major. Uh, doesn't do it at least at that time. Didn't do a heck of a lot about educating people about you know how uh, things work in the world uh, other than in the form of uh, economics. And so I got to my senior year. <laughs> thinking, I thinking I got to get a job. What should I you know what what, what should I do? And uh, I'd worked the reunions over, uh, over the years, and I, d I found the reunions kind of fascinating, working with these people who are kind of 20 or 25 years out. People are out as long as I've been out now. And I, I'd observe them when I was at the, at the reunions, and uh, I, I noticed something. You know, there would be a lot of, a lot of uh, folks, a lot of guys particularly, who had kind of been uh, here at Yale and then studied economics, and then, you know, they'd talk about it. I went two years Lehman and then two years Harvard Business School, and now I've been 20 years at Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley, and now I'm a partner and, you know, kind of uh, up. And look, that's terrific, and the world needs partners at Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. But for me, I heard that story, and I just said, you know, that I see a lot of my classmates kind of heading towards that story, you know, headed towards that, that career path. And like, I just don't, don't kind of want to be like everybody else. And I, that, doesn't, that career path doesn't really speak to me, you know, being a banker or consultant. Or how many people, how many people your roommates or, yeah, your roommates or your friends are kind of thinking about going down that path? Yeah? <laughs> Yeah, everybody. And how, many, and how many of you are like passionate about going down that path? Like, hey, I want to do that. Yeah, all right, good. And that's, hey, one in every room. And, uh, and how many of you have thought about it because you don't really know how you're going to pay back your student loans otherwise? Right? 
A couple of hands, a couple of hands, great. Well, this, that's, that, first off, that's tremendous progress, because 20 years ago, that was kind of the, uh, the, the thing that you would do. You'd, you'd head it out to banking or consulting or maybe law school or uh, working on a political campaign like my uh, roommates did. So, uh, but I saw that and said, like, yeah, that's just not my story. That's not what I want to be a part of. It's not what I want to uh, want to do. <laughs> so I, was, I was reading the paper and I read that international trade was going to be big in the 90s. And I said, well, I'm going to go do international trade. And uh, being, a, uh, being before the internet and being a, a, a data weenie, I got, the, uh, uh, I got the 333 places rated almanac, the 333 cities in America rated, one city per page. And I kind of did a little checklist and I figured out what cities would I be interested in moving to. And I decided between uh, Seattle and, uh, and San Diego. And if you heard earlier, I'm from Buffalo. And so uh, I figured I've done like kind of the northern city close to Canada thing with the crummy weather. Why don't I try San Diego? Because uh, it's close to Mexico and it's, you know, it's on the Pacific Ocean. That's got to be international, right? So I uh, moved out to San Diego, didn't know anybody. Uh, worked in a couple other uh, companies for a few years. I started a company uh, exporting US made pet food to Japan. <laughs> and my notes say to pause for laughter here, so please go ahead. <laughs> I'm laughing on the inside. Uh, and it, it's as strange as it sounds, right? But I was, uh, uh, it turns out that Japan imports a lot of agricultural products, and particularly pet food from the US. And so I was running up and down Japan selling, you know, pushing kibble in Kobe, right? And, uh, uh, it, you know, fa fascinating experience. Um, but after, uh, you know, after a couple of years, I realized, okay, this is just me. I've raised a little bit of money to do this business. Uh, but like, I can't raise any more money to kind of get a bigger scale. And, uh, there was one morning I woke up in kind of a, you know, in the hotel room in Tokyo, like that scene in Lost in Translation. And uh, I said, uh, you know, wow, if I could be like the king of the Japanese pet food business at the age of 30, would that be enough? And uh, would that be like, is that what I want to do? And uh, I really decided no, that's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not really, surprisingly enough, that wasn't fulfilling enough, right? Uh, and uh, so then I, uh, I figured, hey, why don't I, uh, why don't I go to, uh, I'll go to business school, right? And I'll go to business school, it'll be, give me a chance to reset, and I'll be able to kind of go do something uh, afterwards, kind of on a bigger scale. Uh, so I uh, went to HBS and uh, you know, a lot of great professors there. And one particular pr uh, professor said uh, you know, a couple things that are interesting to me that I always share with people in kind of this, this format, because they're really two of the greatest pieces of advice that you'll, that you'll ever get. Uh, and, and one was, uh, look, if you're thinking of being an entrepreneur, what a lot of you are going to say, he would tell the class, what I'm going to say is uh, I'm going to go take the banking job or the consulting job and make a big pile of money. I'm going to save a big pile of money. And then four or five years from now, I'm going to be able to go out and start my own business. And this professor said, well, look, I'm going to give you some advice. All of you are going to ignore the advice. And then you're going to come back at the fifth year reunion and say, professor, you were really right about that advice. So the advice was, uh, you know, don't do that because uh, <laughs> Because two things, one, expenses rise to meet income. So uh, this, this sounds kind of crazy to you sitting here in, in, in college or in grad school thinking, hey, I really, really know how to manage a budget right now because I don't spend much, so why would I possibly spend, you know, all, uh, all, if I was making more, why would I spend more? Expenses rise to meet income. You know, there's a, there's a famous New York Magazine article by Tom Wolf on uh, uh, living in New York called Scraping By on $10 million a year. And it, uh, and it goes through and it shows you that when your peer group is spending this, there's social pressure, there's professional pressure, there's personal pressure, uh, there's psychological pressure to just kind of end up spending the same amount of money as your, as, as your peers and you end up actually not saving dough. You see? And, uh, <laughs> and then the second thing is if you go into banking or consulting or one of these things, you're actually not going to learn to do anything. You're going to be a highly paid advisor with no experience to people who are actually doing stuff. And uh, that might seem interesting, it might seem great, you know, to be able to, sit, to be the fly on the wall and hear all this great stuff. But the really important thing about being successful in business or successful in your career isn't sitting and listening to other people making uh, tough decisions. It's not advising people on what you would do if you were in their shoes. What it is, is coming into a decision that you've come to through all the difficulties of making a decision the pros and cons, the sleepless nights, the tossing back and forth, the arguments sometimes, the difficulty of piecing out the signal from the noise, coming to a decision and, made, and finally deciding and committing to your great decision and like, here's what we're gonna go do and then discovering that you're wrong. That's one of the most important things that you can do in life because you had all this, particularly uh, group smart Ivy Leaguers like uh, you, 
you have all these um, tremendous analytical capabilities that you have used over and over and over in your life to kind of solve all of the problems that you've had in your educational career, which is your profession right now, but you've had, that's how you've solved all your problems. And discovering that sometimes that doesn't work in the real world is really one of the best lessons that you can learn. And then figuring out, okay, well that didn't work, what am I gonna do to work? And then you're gonna try another decision, that's not gonna work. And you're gonna try something else, that's not gonna work. You're gonna try something else, and that is gonna work a little bit. You're gonna learn a little bit from that. And because you had to fight and struggle and go through all those difficulties to learn that little bit of knowledge, that's gonna mean so much more to you than hearing somebody else go through that struggle and observing somebody else go through that struggle. So uh, yeah, those were his two pieces of advice. I told you the part that he said, everybody, y'all gonna ignore that advice, then you came back. I ignored the advice. So uh, I went off and I, uh, I was like, hey, I wanna be a meta entrepreneur. You know, I, I was a small scale entrepreneur in uh, pet food. I'm gonna be a meta entrepreneur. I'm gonna go to one of these, you know, uh, private equity firms. I'll help run 10 businesses and like, I'm gonna learn more and then I'll go out to get to my own thing. And it just turns out that's not true. Like, you know, private equity is about being the finance, finance or strategy guy, but it's, you're not actually running the business. You're not making the decisions and you're not, like kind of living and breathing of being an operator. So uh, after about a year and a half of that, I said, okay, I'm gonna go into industry and actually find a job that's interesting to me in, uh, uh, in, the, in the internet space, because it's kind of, it's booming now, and you know, I was a computer geek in junior high, so why don't I go and you know, do that? Uh, so I looked around a bunch of things and ended up going uh, and finding hotjobs.com. Now, how many, of you have, how many of you have heard of hotjobs.com at this point? A little higher, I need your hands a little higher. Uh, probably only about a fifth of the room. So at, at, at that point, it was the uh, uh, number two job board in the U.S. behind uh, Monster. And just to show hands for fun, how many of you ever applied for a job out of the newspaper? You saw an ad in the newspaper, and a couple of us. Okay, great. Uh, it's like the secret fraternity of people who remember newspapers, right? Uh, <laughs> they showed up on your doorstep. Uh, and so I joined, uh, I joined Hot Jobs and it sounded like really interesting and kind of obvious. Well, look, people print out their resumes and send them in and people have jobs and they put them on a piece of paper and that you know, gets attached to the back of your newspaper. It seems like information technology is probably gonna make those two things go away, right? And it's all gonna be done online or through electronic means. So I joined uh, Hot Jobs and just had an amazing, uh, amazing experience, uh, uh, you know, because you're at a, uh, they're already public when I joined them. Uh, I ended up uh, kind of taking over a very dot com, dot com era was a little bit crazy. I ended up having a strange job where I ran uh, corporate development. That's all of our conversations with other companies about partnering or uh, acquiring them. Uh, business development, online marketing, and then content and community on the site. Uh, and just an amazing experience. So to get to see all these different uh, parts of the business in a company that grew from 88 people three months before I joined, to, I was employee 222 to 700 people six months later. Uh, and so just this amazing, uh, amazing rocket ship. And uh, eventually uh, Yahoo bought us, and uh, uh, bought us for a half billion dollars. And uh, Yahoo did what they do with all their acquisitions, which is they managed us horribly and made everybody leave, right? Uh, I mean, it's actually kind of a core comp, I'm, I'm on camera, aren't I? <laughs> Sorry, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's true. Uh, if you, if you, if you, I mean, if you look before Marissa Meyer, okay, before Marissa, uh, <laughs> you're good. Uh, but it was a really core competency. They'd acquire your business, and like the top ten people would leave within six months. And so I, I, uh, I left within uh, uh, six months, uh, just because they're a large company. It just it didn't work, and. Uh, I wanted to do something entrepreneurial at that point. I'm like, okay, I, I, I had gone to the big, uh, the, big uh, uh, the private equity firm. I'd done the uh, uh, kind of very interesting, fast growing uh, internet company. I'd done a lot of very, very interesting uh, uh, different things. Why don't I go and do something, you know, also in, uh, in online recruitment? And uh, the interesting thing to me was that at that point, this is 10 years ago, kind of two areas of the market that weren't being uh, addressed were the hourly market, kind of the lowest end of the market, and the upper end of the market, people making uh, you know, over 100K a year. And um, to me, that really seemed like kind of the most interesting, uh, interesting parts of the business. Uh, I ultimately uh, uh, you know, decided to do the higher end, of the, uh, higher end of the scale. And the way that that came about was, uh, so I'm from a big Irish Italian Catholic family. I've got 36 first cousins. Can anybody beat that, by the way? Who's got more than 36? Yes? How many? 45? 36? 56? 
So I've, I've, so the highest number I've heard on that one, though, uh, was a guy at HBS at 67, and he beat me. But 57 is pretty amazing. That's awesome. Uh, and, uh, and so a couple of my uh, cousins lived in New York. They were high-end uh, uh, salespeople. Um, and you know, they called me and said, hey, you know, Mr. Hot Jobs, where can I find like, a you know, really great job, really great sales job? You must know. I was like, well, it's really easy. You just go online, and uh, you just kind of look all this stuff, and you can see all the jobs on there, and then you apply. And so she said to me, well, how do you do that? It's super simple. I have no idea what you're talking about. Can you just do it for me? It's like you can see kind of like the salesperson in her, right? She's getting me to do her work for her. Uh, and so I'm like, okay, fine, I'll go do it. So I, I went and got a bunch of job listings, put them into an email, and sent them off to her. That is terrific. This is awesome. Next week, she calls back. Hey, that was really great. Can you do it again? I'm like, ah, no problem. I got it. And went and did all the surfing, put the links into email, sent it off to her. Great. Calls me again the third week. Wow, those were great. Can you do that again? So at this point, my expensive business school education kicks in, and I say, hey, here is a customer with an unmet need, right? Uh, they need, she needs, my cousins need, a listing of high-end jobs. It's actually a little bit difficult at that point to actually find, just even finding them is kind of tough. Uh, and so uh, I call a guy who had worked for me at, uh, at Hot Jobs, uh, and I was like, Alex, here's my idea. We're going to take all the great jobs out there. We're going to put them into an email newsletter, and we're going to... Uh, email it to customers, we're going to charge them 25 bucks a month for it. And he said, Mark, I think that's a great idea. And I was like, Alex, I think it's a good idea. He's like, Mark, I think it's a great idea. I'm like, Alex, I think it's a great idea. So uh, we went out and we talked to a bunch of software developers. Uh, they all told us it would be three months and $30,000 to build a prototype. Uh, and you guys, you guys know that prototype is tech jargon for, it worked when I gave it to you, right? Uh, <laughs> And at the, t at the time, now that seems cheap and fast, but uh, at the time I was like, you know, uh, wow, I, I, you know, I don't want to wait three months. I don't really want to give you $30,000. So I went out and bought a bunch of PHP and MySQL web programming books, taught myself web, enough web programming uh, to launch the site and th build, build the site and launch it in three weeks. It was a very, very, very uh, simple site. Uh, uh, but the important thing was that we were live, right? And we could send emails and we had the jobs listed on the site. And uh, you know, at the beginning, it was all it, it was all free. Now, which who here is in that ten week? What's the ten week boot camp called? Tech boot camp. <laughs> Marketing geniuses behind that name, right? <laughs> Simple. Call it what it is, duh, right? So, tech. How many people in tech boot camp? Yeah, great. So, like right now, the things that you are learning in your ten week program. How many of you feel? You know, I'm I'm just telling you. Like a lot, of, you're going to be in a position at the end of ten weeks that. You're going to be able to at least create a prototype of something that you know, is, is interesting and that you can uh, get customer reactions to. So we launched at the end of uh, August with uh, three subscribers out of a, actually out of a Craigslist ad. And uh, uh, you know, it was kind of off to the races. And we could learn from what people responded to us about the job listings that we were, uh, that we were sending them. And in the early days, what it was, was uh, kind of during the week, we were doing like all the business stuff, like the marketing and the, let's see if we can get free interns from NYU and are yeah, we going to raise money and what are we going to do? And then we actually, on the weekend, we set aside the weekends to, we're going to actually collect all the jobs that we're going to send to people, right? And, and so it was, our shifts were Friday night, 5 to 10, Saturday, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., and then Sunday noon until whenever we got it, uh, and whenever we got it done. And uh, usually it usually would be sometime after midnight. And so we, you know, it was me and a, Two guys that worked for me with me at Hot Jobs, and so uh, I don't know. It's like you know eight or nine weeks in, and uh, uh, the way it would work is we'd kind of finish sometime Sunday after midnight, and then I was the editor, uh, and so I would have to go through and edit all the jobs to make sure they're right in the right right buckets. And then I was the coder at the uh, at the company, so around four o'clock in the morning, I'd start coding the thing to send out the weekly email, uh, and then I thought it was important to kind of say something in the weekly email that we uh, sent out to everybody. Uh, so around 7 a.m., I'd start, you know, writing the email that it goes out to everybody. And I don't know, it's like eight or nine weeks in, and I'm just like, I pulled a couple of letters that week, you know, and it gets to, you know, it was like really, really important to me to like get it done by 9 a.m. in the morning and get this out there so people would start their job hunt. And I just can't get it done. You know, I, you know nine o'clock comes and goes, and like, you know, the, the keys on the keyboard are like this big. I can't like hit them anymore, and the <laughs> screen's talking back to me. And not the reason the screen talks back to you guys in college, though, right? And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, I just can't get it done. So it comes to like 9, 9 16, 9 17 in the morning, and like, ding in my inbox. Hey, uh, the ladders, you guys didn't go away, did you? Where's my uh, weekly newsletter? I need to, need to start my job hunt. 9 18 in my inbox, ding, ding. Hey, where are you guys? You're not one of those little dot coms that went out of business. I really need you to search for my job. 
Like that is the moment when kind of, you know, the, uh, the clouds part and that the ray of sunshine comes down. Yeah, right? It's like, you know, the, the message in the bottle washes up on the shore. That's like when you really know that you've done something when it's like eight or nine weeks into it and, you know, it's a free product and people have already changed their behavior based on the thing that you created. So we, we kind of knew that we were, we were onto something. Uh, so at that point, it was a, a, a free product. And you got a lot of you who are starting your companies are kind of pre-revenue, so you know how this, uh, this feels. We're, we were doing the uh, weekly meeting at my apartment in Manhattan's East Village. Uh, and then everybody's working from home during the week. And at that point, uh, I was a bachelor, and so like my idea of hospitality was, I don't know, I still don't know what I was thinking, but everybody would come over and I'd have a plate of uh, salami and Pringles out, <laughs> right? And that was, guys, look what I got for you, right? <laughs> Salami and Pringles, have as much as you want. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking. And uh, so eventually it's like, oh, look, we, we got it. If we're going to make this thing work, we got to like, you know, find, you know, get like an office or something. And uh, so you know, went around town and found like one of those office spaces before the WeWorks and the General Assemblies came along. Uh, and you know, they, they gave you, it's this great choice they give you. It's like, uh, so probably from me to that wall and then like from here over to those chairs is the size of the room. The interior room without the windows is a thousand bucks a month, and the exterior room with like a window and sunlight is fifteen hundred a month. And so, which one do you take when you start off? Right, the thousand buck a month one, right, with no sunlight. And uh, the guy who runs the place, he's, he's not a dummy. He's like, I've seen a lot of you startups come and go. It's two thousand three. You're going to be out of business before you even start. So it's six months in advance and a month security deposit. Right. <laughs> Great. So, uh, you know, so I go in and, uh, you know, it's, it's, one of those, it's one of those moments that you come to in your life when you're, uh, when you're an entrepreneur and it, it's, it's important and you guys all come to it. Uh, so, uh, you know, I go in and uh, sit down with them and I write, you know, write out the check. It's November 14th, 2003, uh, paid to Executive Office Suites, amount, you know, $7,000. And then they make you like write it out like in full just to remind you how stupid you're being, right? $7,000. And uh, for rent. And then you come to the line. You come to the signature line. And it's that line that separates the past from the future. It's the line that separates the people who talk about being an entrepreneur from being an entrepreneur. It's the line that all of you are going to face sooner or later in your career where your colleagues, your classmates, your friends are going to be saying, hey, I've got this great job at. Google, Goldman Sachs, the government, Facebook, Twitter, someplace. Why don't you come here and work with me? And you're going to have to make that decision for yourself as to whether you really want to be an entrepreneur or whether you, whether you don't. It's, you know, it's okay if you don't want to be an entrepreneur. Most, you know what we call people who don't want to be entrepreneurs? Customers. <laughs> right? And it's okay. Uh, if there weren't for them, what would we do? But, uh, you come to that line, and so I signed that line. I was thinking, you know, I, I signed my name on that line. I was thinking, this is either going to be like a good idea, or it's going to be the dumbest, most expensive hobby I've ever had. Uh, <laughs> so from that point, we uh, uh, so we were free. We started charging in January of 2004. Uh, we, we, you know, the free product. The day before we started charging was 300. You know, get three, 300 jobs a week sent to your. Uh, inbox. The free product the day after we started charging was you get 300 jobs a week sent to your inbox. But the paid product was you get 1,200 jobs sent and you get them sent two weeks before everybody else. And uh, you know, we were kind of, it was off to the races uh, uh, from there for us. Uh, we uh, ended up raising uh, an angel round of about three quarters of a million and then a series A round uh, ten months, eight months later of uh, seven million. When you're looking to raise money, uh, particularly at that time, the easiest way to raise money is to uh, already have revenue coming in the door. If you can say, look, actually, I don't need your money to stay in business, but it can help me get there faster. We already have enough dough coming in to you know, keep the lights on. Uh, that's like a very uh, you know, attractive, uh, attractive thing. So over the years at, uh, uh, at, the, at the ladders, so I spent, uh, what did I spend? Seven, eight years as uh, CEO. I'm now founder and chairman. Uh, so still active in the business, but uh, handed the uh, CEO reins over to my co-founder two years ago. Uh, I think looking back on that experience, the two most important things that I would uh, recommend to all of you as you're thinking about this, the two, really the two most important things, and really just about everything else falls away in importance, is 
the people you work with uh, and your product and the and really the customer's relationship to your uh, uh, to your product there are a couple different uh, uh, slide decks out there there's one from uh, Dropbox that goes through all of the dumb management mistakes that they made and just it's really every single man everything everything they did as a management team was wrong right except for the product the product really 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 made sense and their point uh, in their deck is product market fit can cover and excuse almost all sins of management almost all and in, and in this particular this day it wasn't true 20 years ago maybe it won't be true in 20 years but in this particular day and age it really is true uh, if you get product market fit, if you get a product that your customers say, I have to have this, just about everything else will work out. Uh, and so the really, really important thing for you as you're thinking through my product or what am I building or as in the uh, boot camp as you uh, think about what you're building is, are people crazy about it? If they don't have it, will they email you at 9 in the morning on a, on a Monday morning? If they don't have it, will their life be worse? Right. Uh, if uh, if Splitwise went away, if Splitwise went away, uh, would would you would you write to them and say, my God, where'd you guys go? I need to split my bills. <laughs> yes. No. Maybe. Yeah. Perhaps. And then uh, the gentleman who was using Lyft is out. Right. Mm -hmm. right. But if Lyft went away, it sounds like he might actually like write to them and say, my God. And you and your app, if your app went away, would you write to yourself? <laughs> you're you're like ready to pop out of your seat. Like, whatever it is, whoever's at a VC in this room, invest in this man's business because he's like he's got some energy. Uh, so the most important thing really is, is uh, that product market fit can solve so many other, uh, uh, so many other problems. Uh, and the, way that you're, the only way you're going to get to really a great, a great, great, great product is working with terrific people. I have had so many times over the years, either people who work for me or people who uh, you know, have their own startup business come to me with the yes, but explanation. Yeah, you know, um, Andy's not the, really the right guy for the job. But we really need somebody right now. Uh, Helen isn't quite what we were hoping for, but it's important for us to have another engineer. Uh, anytime that you find yourself saying yes, but about somebody that you're thinking of hiring or somebody you're bringing on board, I think that the most important thing to, um, one of my favorite quotes is Warren Buffett's, uh, where he says, uh, after some early mistakes in business, I learned to only ever work with people that I like, trust, sorry, like, trust, respect, and admire. And I've never made an error after doing that. Uh, and I, th I don't know, I read that like probably six or seven years ago after making some of those errors, some of those uh, hiring errors. Uh, and it's really, really true. If you only work with people that you like, trust, respect, and admire. Now, if you're sitting here and you haven't, how many people have never hired anybody before? How many people have not hired people before? Right, so about half, half two-thirds of the room. Uh, so this is going to sound a little bit abstract to you. Like, what does that mean to hire people? I mean, don't I just need to like, add, add people to your team? So yes and no, it's a little, uh, it's a little abstract. But uh, I mean, doesn't it kind of make sense? Like, when you think about when you perform best in life, when you think about uh, when you're best on a sports team, when you perform best in a study group, when you perform best in a conversation, it's when, you're work, it's when your teammates or the people that you're, you're with are people that you, you feel understand you. And that you feel, well, I, I, I kind of get them and they get me. And I, I, I enjoy watching what they do in sports or music or whatever it is. That, that's kind of an eternal truth and that doesn't change just because you get into business. So if you can take away something, uh, I'd follow that advice. Hey, only work with people that you like, trust, uh, respect, uh, and admire. Uh, so for uh, so for the ladders, we kind of we took off, we like a, uh, went off like a rocket ship. Uh, you know, the business was hey, it's free for employers to charge, uh, free for employers to post their jobs, and we charge professionals twenty five bucks a month or one hundred fifty bucks a year to get access to kind of all of the listings. And over the years, the website's gotten more and more uh, detailed. Uh, in two thousand eight, we uh, after talking to a lot of people, we got some advice that, hey, look, Fortune 1000 companies are never going to take you seriously if you're a free resource. Uh, we, and so we actually we went and we charged. You know, uh, we decided, hey, right, great, then we'll charge uh, corporates for access to the, to the system. 
Uh, it actually ended up being a bad decision. We spent every different which way and uh, over the next four years trying to solve for the errors in that decision. What happens when you charge in a two-sided network? You can charge one side for access to the network and you can charge the other side for additional services or additional information. You can't charge both sides for access to the network because what that does is it reduces your overall network size and kind of the activity going on on the site. Uh, over four years, we tried every, every different which way. We tried, uh, look, there's a free three months if you sign up. There's, if it's a very small amount of usage, it's free. If you tell us that you hired a lot of people, we'll reduce the, uh, reduce the price for you. At the end of it, after four years, we just decided, look, that's, it's just simply not working. And uh, what we'll do is we're going to actually go all the way back to our original model, which is it's free for employers to post jobs, and uh, we're going to continue to charge job seekers. And I think in the last four, in the four years that we were, uh, had made that decision, the world changed, and Fortune 1000 companies kind of changed their thinking on free tools um, so that, as a result now, looking back, we're probably twice as large as we were uh, in 2008 when we made that decision. Um, uh, and so that's where the latter story kind of, I then handed it off to uh, my co-founder. I had spent some time with uh, Meg Whitman, who was CEO at eBay early, uh, early on the ladders. And she said, look, you should really only stay at the helm of your company eight or 10 years after that time to give somebody else uh, a, a shot at it. So after eight years, I handed the reins over to my co-founder uh, and spent some time thinking about what I wanted to do. Uh, and what it turned out what I wanted to do uh, was uh, still something in uh, people and how they represent themselves. If you think about it, uh, the ladders is how you represent yourself in a job. Here's my background, here are the companies I work for, here are my skill set. And that, that's, that's kind of interesting. Uh, over the years at the ladders, we'd done a lot of work with uh, personality types and uh, how different personality types work together and how, how teamwork occurs and how it doesn't occur. How many people have heard of the, like the Myers-Briggs personality test? My lord, that is pretty, that's amazing. That's like 80% of the room. Uh, so we had everybody at the ladders go through and uh, uh, do the uh, uh, Myers-Briggs personality test. And it's really interesting when you're in a work environment. So if you're a very analytical person and uh, somebody who's very relationship driven, is uh, interpersonal uh, driven, is trying to uh, persuade you of something, what will they do? They'll come up with all the people who agree with them. They'll come up with all the people who like the idea. They'll point out the importance to the groups working on it of the idea, and they'll point out all these human relationship factors that go into the decision. Whereas if you're very analytical, you, all you're hearing is, there is no data behind any of this. How come you are not sharing any data? Why are you hiding the data from me? I am now angry at you for hiding the data from me. And once you've, once you've done this and you've kind of been, been through the, the training a little bit, you, see, you just see it, you, every conflict at work and at home, you, kind of, you see like exactly what's, kind of, what's feeding into it anyway. Uh, and so you know, I'd, uh, we had done some tests at the ladders. I'm getting a little bit deeper, but just because it was an employment product, you know, decided that we, uh, we couldn't. And uh, you know, it's kind of amazing what, uh, what, we're, what the internet enables uh, these days. So if I tell you, hey, I got this new idea for a business. Uh, when you have a really big problem in your life, uh, you're just committed to DUI and uh, you need an attorney. Uh, you think you have cancer uh, or, uh, or good, you know, something good in your life, but uh, you think maybe you're, you're, you're pregnant. What I want you to do is I want you to come type it into my site. Then I'm going to take that information about you and I'm going to sell it to advertisers and I'm going to keep all the money. How do you like my business idea? How many people would invest in that business? Right, that's Google. Right, that is what Google does. Right, you go and you type your stuff. If, if, if you look on uh, Google, I actually, and I did a long blog post on this, a DUI attorney costs you a buck 37 uh, to buy the click. Uh, am I pregnant is, I think, $3.17. Uh, uh, yeah, and the other ones have, there's always some price. And if you think about it, uh, I don't know, how about, well, how about this room? If, uh, let's say you, you, saw, uh, you decided, how many people have ever had that thing happen to you where you're like, I've got some fatal, horrible disease, I know it. I'm, I'm gonna go, yeah, I've I know I've got it now, it's all over for me. And uh, did, you, did you go talk to your friends about it first or you go to Google first? 
and type in, you know, symptoms. A couple of you that went to Google first. Yeah, I see some nods out there. And it's kind of interesting. For thousands of years, we as people, for millions of years, like you had some big problem or some big issue. You went to the village elder. You went to, you know, your religious figure. You maybe you went to, you know, your best friend or your spouse or whatnot. Uh, Today, increasingly, we, kind of, we go to Google. We go to the internet first to kind of uh, search these things. And isn't that kind of very, very interesting that that is one of the first places that we go? And uh, so my friends over at uh, OkCupid have, uh, have done some research on, have, how many people have read their blog, OkCupid's blog? Yeah, it's one of the most, just this side of the room, right? <laughs> yeah, this is the data-driven side of the room, I don't know. Uh, and. Uh, so they got me. They ask like 250,000 questions on uh, OKCupid. All these questions you get answered. About 5,000 are in high rotation, and so they did a uh, uh, you know they did a correlation uh, uh, between you know the answer to these questions and other things that uh, they they could find out about you. So uh, one of the famous blog posts he did is let's say you want to find out about you know somebody you're meeting for a first date, but you don't want to ask them you know the questions directly. Like you don't want to ask them about their politics uh, uh, directly or their religion directly or uh, those types of things. Well, are there questions that correlate with those answers to their politics or religion that very highly correlate that you could ask them that wouldn't be so obvious? And it turns out that there are. So, uh, um, the, uh, so the famous one, and I've got to do this on camera, so, it's, uh, so the famous one is if you, uh, if you want to find out if uh, you're gonna get lucky on your first date, right? Uh, like you don't, you obviously don't ask that uh, directly, but... Uh, <laughs> What question could you answer? And this blog says, not me, but this blog says, the question most highly correlated with uh, promiscuity on their site is, do you like the taste of beer? So people who answer yes are twice as likely to end up being promiscuous as, uh, as people who uh, answer no. Let's say, you want to answer, let's say you want to find out about your uh, first date's politics, and you want to ask directly, are you conservative or liberal? What other question could you an answer, ask? And that question is, uh, do you prefer the people in your life to be simple or complex? <laughs> now, I love this question because I've, I've, I've kind of shared this with audiences all over the country in blue states and red states. Both sides think they're right. Uh, so, uh, so, if you're, so if you answer, I like the people to be, my life to be more complex, well, are you, are you conservative or liberal? What do you think? Liberal, and if you say I like people in my life to be more simple, are you conservative or liberal? You're conservative. What liberals, and I'm assuming from the laughs in the audience, that, that, that's, uh, I'm guessing uh, the uh, blue state that it's changed, is uh, of course you want people in your life to be complex. It's either complexity and kind of interesting, and it's kind of amazing that people do that. And who wants people, boring, simple people? Uh, people in red states say, who wants those people who put on airs and are always kind of faking and posing about being something that they're not, instead of being good, simple, ordinary, Americans. So that's what, and, and so both sides kind of think that they're right. Uh, you, want to, you want to find out if uh, somebody is religious or not. You don't want to ask them directly. You ask, do spelling and grammar mistakes irritate you? <laughs> and if you say yes, what do you think? Are you religious? Are you, so say you say yes, spelling and grammar mistakes irritate me. Are you twice as likely to be religious or not religious? religious. Not religious. Religious people are more forgiving, right? This is, I guess, I guess. That's what the data say. I'm just, I'm, you know, imposing on it. But uh, uh, maybe it's like spelling and grammar errors. Like, yeah, who cares? It's this world, right? There's, there's something in the next that matters a lot more. I, I don't know. We all went to Yale, right? That like, spelling and grammar mistakes really irritate us, right? Um, uh, but so anyway, so the interesting thing about it, so first off, those are fun party tricks. But uh, second, uh, isn't that fascinating? Okay, I, took, I was studying poli sci here at, uh, at, at Yale, um, and in the, I've done a ton of reading, and I had never kind of like really put those, the, like that conservative liberal thing together uh, before. And isn't it interesting that the vast scale of the internet allows us to create these correlations between things that people didn't even realize that they were telling us? Right? That they, they didn't know that they were telling us uh, when they answered those, uh, those other questions. Um, and so I thought, wow, that is kind of fascinating. What else can I figure out about people by having them or their friends answer questions? Uh, what else can I figure out about them that they don't necessarily realize or that they you know, think they're having fun doing? 
So uh, my new business is called uh, Nozen. It originally was kind of uh, the dozen people you know be best. So no a dozen, shortened to Nozen, K-N-O-Z-E-N. And we're bringing personality to the internet. Uh, and basically what we're doing is we're crowdsourcing personality profiles. So when you sign up, and you can all sign up, go to nosen.com. And uh, when you sign up, we'll show you people from your work or your school or uh, people in your social network. And we'll ask you questions like, uh, between Heather and James, who's more analytical? Between uh, Sally and Susan, who's more likely to invite you out for happy hour? Between uh, Bob and Steve, who's more uh, organized? So, uh, uh, and from all those little data points, we're able to create a personality profile, a crowdsourced uh, uh, a personality profile uh, for each person in the, uh, in the, in the system. Um, so I had this idea two years ago, and the, uh, I realized it needed to be mobile. And uh, something that people do when they kind of do try to go out and do their second, bit, uh, their second kind of entrepreneurial venture after the first one's had some uh, scale of success is they try to not do everything that they did before because it was so painful to go through and like do the, oh man, I gotta go do the, uh, uh, be in the small little, uh, uh, you know, rented office space, or I gotta like code the thing up from scratch, or I gotta like, you know, uh, hack it out with uh, developers. A lot of people seek to avoid that. And as I've gone around and talked to my uh, venture capital friends, it turns out that a couple of them say, our highest rate of failure among entrepreneurs is second time entrepreneurs who try to do something different than what they did before. And so I said, I'm gonna learn from that. Um, you know, and there's also, it's a similar thing actually in music. There's the, uh, the, sophomore, out, uh, the sophomore slump, like the, the band comes out, they do a great first album, and the second you know, album, it's kind of like, eh, I don't know, it's not that great. Um, I think a lot of it's because people don't do the thing that they, uh, that they did before. So I, knew, I realized that this had to be, uh, had to be mobile, uh, and the, the danger for anybody going from one platform to another is that they'll try to apply the lessons from the prior platform to the new one. So if you were a mainframe person and you tried to apply those lessons to the PC era, it just didn't work. Uh, I've been a desktop guy for, I don't know, 30 years and I want to do something on mobile. And so I said, look, that's, if I just kind of go and hire a bunch of people and then try to tell them off of my instincts what to do, I'm, that's never going to work. So uh, I actually said, I'm going to go and I'm going to learn from the ground up again, coding. And I've actually, I've never really been a proper uh, developer, so I'd like to do it you know, one time all the way through. So I spent a year learning Objective-C, Python, uh, Amazon Web Services, Nginx, enough on security to be dangerous. Uh, and I said, I'm going to get the alpha version of the site out myself. I have no help. I'm going to get the alpha version out, uh, me personally. So I spent over a year building it and uh, learning, shipped it last summer. Uh, it worked. <laughs> it didn't crash out in the wild. Uh, then went out and raised uh, two and a quarter million uh, from uh, uh, two of my VC buddies in uh, New York in the fall. Uh, the best way, the, sec the next best way to raise uh, venture capital when you're kind of doing it the second time around isn't to show up on somebody's doorstep and say, hey, I need to raise a bunch of money today. Can, I, can you help me out? It's you know, 12, really 12 months before I was starting, I reached out and said, hey, here's what I'm thinking of doing, uh, over lunch or whatever, hey, here's what I'm thinking of doing. Would you be interested at the time that I decided to kind of raise money, would you be interested in participating? Maybe. Oh, maybe, yes, okay, great. Uh, nine months before you know, I'm actually gonna raise money, hey, I'm still working on that thing, just to let you know I'm still Cranking away, I think we're gonna have the alpha out you know, pretty soon, six months ahead of time. Hey, I got the alpha out, found, learned some interesting stuff, and I'm not raising money now, but next time or next next time I talk to you, I probably am gonna be, three months before. Hey, uh, things are going great, I'm really pretty fired up. When I come back from uh, summer vacation, Labor Day, I'm gonna be raising money in three months when I talk to you. So I ended up coming back uh, last September, and it was really, it was 10 days end to end uh, to raise money because I kind of told people all the way along, hey, here's what, here's what we're doing. Uh, interesting, you know, tons of interesting stuff compared this time to last time. Uh, you know, the tool sets out there are completely amazing. And it's, you know, Amazon Web Services in itself is uh, totally amazing. Uh, one of the things that when I was starting uh, this one, I needed a little bit of help uh, after I got past the alpha on uh, uh, just you know, some Python backend stuff and some uh, things on the iPhone and ended up hiring people just part-time, just 10 hours a week off of, uh, off of Odesk. Have you guys heard of Odesk? Right? So it's kind of like the global freelance market. And I got amazingly talented people on there and it ended up turning in from five hours to 10 hours to uh, actually two of the guys are now full-time on, uh, on my staff, uh, although they're based in the Ukraine and China. I've never met them uh, <laughs> personally. Uh, 
they're uh, uh, you know, they're more comfortable chatting than in spoken or video, uh, video English just because it's a second language, so chatting's a, a lot more comfortable for them. Uh, you know, and it's now, it's very easy to have a global workforce um, in a way that just wasn't possible a few years ago. Managing remotely is also pretty, pretty interesting. How many people in the room have managed a remote team before? Uh, maybe not, so, uh, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, when you're managing like a team that's, Hey, five people, let's get together. Hey, 10 people, let's, I'm gonna tell you what we're doing. Let's do it, we've got it up on the board. All right, let's all go, that's one way to manage. Uh, managing a team remotely that doesn't come in every day, it's not, not physically there. Uh, the concept of FaceTime or office time just doesn't exist. It's really, it's, for me, it's been a very interesting intellectual challenge uh, and actually turned out to be, uh, to be great. So uh, I spent the last uh, eight months since raising uh, Dough building really the proper release, release version. Uh, which uh, we submitted to the App Store this, uh, actually last week, and will be coming out uh, next week, and you can sign up for it at nosen.com. Uh, I've learned my lessons from this gentleman over here about promoting your app. Uh, and um, uh, we'll see how things go when we get it out into the wild, and that's really when the hard work will begin, and we'll uh, start learning from, uh, from customers. So uh, with that, uh, why don't I turn it over to, well, why don't I first of all thank you for your time in this semi-hot room. And uh, then why don't I uh, open it to questions, any and all questions from you guys. <clears throat> 45 minutes talk time without looking at the watch. I'm patting myself on the back. <laughs> all right, great. Yes, sir. Uh, so in the long run, it'll be off of uh, a personality API. So uh, if you think about it, so, um, uh, humans, uh, one way of thinking about it, humans are wet machines compared to dry machines like computers or planes or, ca or cars. Uh, and we behave relatively consistently, but not entirely consistently. Uh, the patterns to our behavior are called personality. Uh, so somebody who's very analytical will have certain behaviors that they go through. Somebody who's very organized will have certain behaviors they go through. Uh, wouldn't it be interesting and useful to understand something about those patterns in aggregate? So yeah, and so those will be useful for uh, HR. Uh, so your global company has 10,000 teams, a thousand are top performers, a thousand are bottom performers. What about the makeup of those teams can you learn from personality? Uh, for personal development, for marketing. If, uh, you know, I'm a very, I'm an analytically driven person. If somebody tries to market to me with testimonials of like other people who bought it, like I just don't, like I don't care, I don't read that, right? It doesn't, I want to see the specifications, I want to see the data. Somebody who's very, Relationship driven actually says, you guys who think you think specifications are the way to go, you don't actually know what's going to make you happy. You should listen to what people say and go with testimonials. Um, technology, like right now when, so every, new, every time you open up a new product, uh, so you open up a new version of your bank's website or a new version of Xcode or a new version of, of, of Gmail, today technology treats all of us on this side of the screen like we're exactly the same at the start. But we're not, like we know that we're not. Well, wouldn't it be interesting if there's a personality API that could say, well, this is a very organized person, show them the three page tutorial. This is a very spontaneous person who's not structured, just show them the big buttons and then tell them where to get help uh, later. Uh, <laughs> right, that's me, right? I won't read a tutorial, but like, I just wanna know the big buttons and then if like, I really need your thing later, I'll go read your stuff later in the help section. Uh, recruiting, I just, anything where understanding the, uh, um, tendencies of human beings would be important, will be useful. But what yeah. drives users to use it? Because like, your, your characterization of Google is an like, interesting one, but yeah. a little bit like leaving out information of like the reason I go on and yeah. tell people that like, I'm pregnant is because right. I want information. I'm like, <laughs> if I am pregnant. Like, you like, really do. Like, I really do. So what makes you go what, what's S umlaut O L, by the way? It's soul. You didn't get to the fourth row, which is like yeah. the most exciting one. Uh, yeah. But I can tell you about this amazing organic sports group. We're starting uh, the two of us and one more. So, yeah, it's like. I'm water. drinking water, right? I should have one in my hand. Okay, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the reason you do it is because uh, so, uh, social apps uh, that try to create a new human behavior fail. Uh, social apps that try to augment existing human behaviors have a shot. Uh, so, you know, if you, like if you go through any company, if you go through uh, uh, 
you know, any dining hall here and you're like, listen to what people are talking about. Hey, what, you know, they're, they're talking about their friends, who's up, who's down, who's like this, what's he like? What do you think of him? Hey, what's that guy? That guy's kind of a pain in the ass. What's up with that? You know, isn't she awesome? That's what people talk about all day. Uh, let's give them a way to do, let's give them a, an app that makes that even more fun, right? So, uh, so one of the things that we've done in the beta is every, uh, every few days we spit out a, an email that either says someone from Yale rated you more assertive than Cindy, with a big picture of Cindy there. Okay, now I knew that was gonna be an engaging email. What I didn't realize is that people would see it as validation, right? And so people take these emails and they forward them to Cindy and to, to their colleagues. And they're like, ha, told you so. Uh, and then the other one is uh, top 11, oh yeah, top 11 or top 15 most friendly people in New York City or most analytical people in Chicago. And that one's all, so, like we're we're you know we're 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 storytelling apes, right? We, we tell stories, and the stories that we tell uh, usually revolve around other other people, right? And what they did and what they didn't do. And I mean, all, like if you want to think about it, like personality is world literature, it's world cinema. I mean, that's all it is. It's like you know, these two different. If you want to like really get it down to like the the basics of structure, it's you know a few different people with like different personality uh, types interacted in a surprising manner, right? And uh, and so those stories are what people are really interested in. So we're going to make those interesting and more fun for people. Please download. And I'll, and I'll drink a case of soul. <laughs> yes, sir. How do you know your, um, your time is a better and your time is better spent elsewhere? Perhaps you're you know, investing your time in town, watching other people make mistakes. And from that, you learn something that you might not have otherwise. So in my particular case, uh, and in private equity or consulting or banking in general, you're, you're the times that you interact with clients tend to be uh, so structured and set piece that it's uh, like nobody's really got their true face on, right? They got their mask on. Uh, so it's, it's difficult. Uh, how, many, how many times are there meetings? Are you in consulting? No. Uh, I see some other heads in the room nodding. They're like in consulting. How many times is it that like right, you have the meeting here and then everybody goes out and like, can you believe what he said? I can't believe what that guy said. He said, terrible. I don't agree with anything. Like the meeting, ha the real meeting happens outside of the room. Um, so I like my person, so I learned a ton, uh, but, uh, it wasn't, it, it helped me learn what, I mean, it helped me on my path, right? It, it helped me discover what wasn't right, uh, for me. I think, uh, was it Caroline in the front row here? You said that you, your first year you took, a, all these different courses and it helped you learn what majors not to be, right? And that's an important thing in life, like learning, learning what, what not to do. One of the, and one of the things for, uh, you know, for uh, people in college, uh, your whole life has been about opening doors. Hey, well, music, wow, the, the, hey, the kinks, I can't believe that's an amazing thing. Hey, I never realized I liked high lie, right? You know, it's all about opening doors, <laughs> right? Soccer, this is amazing, World Cup. Uh, uh, after college, it gets to closing doors. And when you're sitting in college, you sit in this classroom, you're kind of sitting there thinking, my God, that sounds awful, I'm gonna close doors, I'm gonna, it's kind of like dying, isn't it? <laughs> right, it's just like I'm, closing doors in preparation for being dead. <laughs> but it's not, right? And what you learn is that uh, learning what you enjoy and learning what like, you know, actually like you can contribute to and what you get back in and what you can get deeper in uh, is actually kind of an enjoyable process. And so learning about the things, the doors to close uh, is important. So for me, like learning that 18 months to close that door on private equity was, you know, it was good for me, even though it turned out that that uh, industry isn't the right one for me.